Good morning. Hello and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and virtually. My name is May Colcord and I'm a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrieli Gabrielino Tongva peoples the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect for the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways of being in community, in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. Today's service is led by our interim minister, our Interim Minister Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley with music by the Cal Arts Japan Ensemble. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary, the narthex, or in our new family lounge in the living room of neighborhood house where the service is live streamed on a big screen. Who doesn't love camp? Today is the opening of registration for neighborhood summer camp at De Beneville Pines, taking place August 25th through 27th in our nearby mountains. This year you can register in person over the next three Sundays on the patio, or you can register online by using the link or QR code in the weekly newsletter. Come and enjoy your church community in a beautiful and relaxing environment. Warning, our limited spots usually run out. If you would like to host a workshop, make sure to reach out to Martin Matthews or other committee members at the camp table on the patio between and after services. There is a drop-in chalice circle today at 1 p.m. in the Remembrance and Renewal dining room of Neighborhood House. This is an opportunity to try out a small group discussion with spiritual themes. Visitors are welcome. Next Sunday, we celebrate a flower communion, so please bring flowers to share with others. And finally, mark your calendars for our annual meeting on May 21st, where we'll vote on the new board officers and members, our budget, and two resolutions. It will be in person and on Zoom, no tech voting by raise of hands, followed by a potluck lunch and volunteer celebration. See the annual report emailed yesterday for the agenda and all materials. There will be a board Q&A today after service, next Sunday at 10.30, and on Wednesday the 17th on Zoom. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email posted in the Narthex or through a QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service. And now I'd like to introduce Myrna Peterson to tell us about the Legacy Society. Myrna. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> 25 years ago, my husband and I became members of Neighborhood Church. And as former members of mainstream Christian religions, it was a very eye-opening experience coming to Neighborhood Church and learning about Unitarian Universalism. We know of no other church that espouses all the values that our religion does. And we have found a community of friends and family here at Neighborhood Church. 20 years ago, the Neighborhood Legacy Society was founded by a group of like-minded indi individuals who wanted to make sure that Neighborhood Church would be here for future generations. We wanted to help ensure that the beacon of liberal religion that is Unitarian Universalism remains here for future generations too. So we joined the Neighborhood Church Legacy Society. 
The Neighborhood Legacy Society is made up of members who have made a commitment to build a long-term, sustainable foundation that supports our faith community and our Unitarian Universalist ancestors' 200-year progressive mission by including Neighborhood Church in our wills and trusts. Legacy Society members are honored by having their name engraved on the Legacy Society, Society sculpture right outside the sanctuary. Information on how to join the Legacy Society can be found on our church website. And if you haven't seen the website, you should take a look at it. It's, it's nice now. <laughs> <laughs> Click on the menu and find the information under the other tab. There's a convenient link to complete the PDF form. There is another link that will give you more information about the Legacy Society and member testimonials. Help keep our liberal faith alive for future generations by joining the Legacy, Legacy Society. Thank you. From here. Hi, good morning, everyone. <laughs> so, we are J Colored Japanese Ensemble. So, we play the instrument from Japan. So, let me quickly introduce who we are. So, we play, we are like, you know, the colored students, alumni, the community members who love Japanese music and it want to learn those instruments. And then we worked so hard throughout the semester and throughout the year. And then we want to share some music from Japan here with you. And then quickly introduction, this instrument, long stringed instrument. This is called the koto, K-O-T-O, -O, koto. And then this is the Japanese harp, so sounds like that. And then there, that's a three strings banjo like instrument. That's called the shamisen, like three strings. Let's try make sound. Uh huh, something like that. And then there's a taiko drum with our wells. <laughs> so that's how it sounds like. Okay, so uh, yes, as any other arts organization, we are having a difficulty financially. So if you have any friends or whoever who can support us, it's always welcome. But we are not here to do that. We are here to share music with you. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Yeah. Today's music is in, um, in, in honor of uh, Asian Pacific Islander Month, which is May. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much for sharing your music and your heritage with us. Vine and branch, we are connected in this world this world of sound and echo, figure and shadow, the leaves contingent, roots pushing against earth. An apple belongs to itself, to stem and tree, to air that claims it and then ground. Connections balance, each motion changes another, precarious, hanging together, we don't know what our lives support, and we touch in the least shift of breathing. Each holy thing is borrowed. Everything depends on us. Come, let us worship together. Our opening hymn is number 194 in your gray hymnal or on the screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing our opening hymn number 194, Faith is a Forest. Good morning. 
I'm Matt Vasco, Neighborhoods Director of Spiritual Exploration. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. So this is time for all ages. And I have two things I want to talk about this morning. Um, I'm going to ask the children and youth to please stay in your seats because we have all these beautiful instruments up here and there's just not enough room to sit up front this morning. Um, but I want to talk to everybody a little bit about some things that have been happening here in Pasadena. And I want to talk about it in a child-friendly way. So sometimes things can happen and they can be a little scary. Um, we have a beautiful LGBTQIA plus flag hanging on the front of our sanctuary. And I want you all, if you would please, to just imagine for a moment what it might feel like if someone tore that flag down and harmed it, how that would hurt us. Um, that happened here in Pasadena recently to our friends over at the Buddhist temple. Their LGBTQIA plus flag was taken down and harmed. And as you can imagine, that was pretty scary for them. And then our friends at All Saints here in town had something scary happen to them this week when someone uh, threatened to do harm to their campus this Sunday. So everyone all around Pasadena is on alert and paying close attention to what's happening and um, those threats at All Saints were also related to um, LGBTQIA plus rights. So um, we, as the caring community that we are, and the loving people that we are, want to support our friends here in Pasadena who are having some scary things happen and so we've got two really beautiful, um, sort of like cards. They're big posters um, that uh, Hannah Peterson, the religious education assistant. There's Hannah. Hannah's, yeah, sure, you can applaud Hannah. Hannah's a wonderful artist. Um, um, she specialized in art in high school, and she made two beautiful, um, uh, they're, they're just images of a person holding a heart, um, surrounded by the colors of the LGBTQIA plus flag, um, just beautiful art. She made two pieces of art like that, and then we mounted them on these big pieces of paper. And we're asking everyone after service today to please sign that, okay? Kids, adults, everybody, please sign that, because that's our love note to our friends at All Saints and our friends at the Buddhist Temple, okay? Can you all do that for me? Yeah. Thank you. And now the second thing I have to talk about is a lot more fun. And that is that this week, we're starting today, is National Teacher Appreciation Week. And we always like to take some time during Teacher Appreciation Week to recognize all of the wonderful people with big hearts who volunteer their time in children and youth spiritual exploration throughout the church year. We are highly grateful for all of them. They give a lot of themselves to our children and youth, and we really appreciate it. This year, many kind and loving souls gave their time in order to be a caring adult in the lives of children and youth here at Neighborhood Church. 
Some of them taught our children and youth in our spiritual exploration classes. Some served as advisors in our two youth groups. And some helped make family chapel happen each and every week. Our children and youth are the future of this faith. So the hard work and dedication of these individuals matters, not just now, but for decades to come. If you have volunteered in the Children and Youth Spiritual Exploration Program this year, serving as a teacher, advisor, owl facilitator, or family chapel volunteer, will you please stand? Thank you all for your work and dedication. It means the world to us. And now, please join me in singing our children and youth out to their spiritual exploration classes. Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen. If you wish to make a payment toward your pledge or contribute to church operations, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation box. This week, our gifts go to the Los Angeles Education Corps. Here to tell us more is Lexi Schweed. Lexi? <laughs> um, so I'm Lexi, I know most of you. Um, my boss, Andrea, is here too, if you wanna say hi to her after. Um, I'm a reading specialist at Los Angeles Education Corps, um, and it was described to me when I first started working there as a second chance school. Um, a lot of our students, we have traditional age high schools and adult high schools, um, you know, have maybe dropped out and dropped back in. They've had different, you know, life difficulties. And, you know, we focus on finding jobs, job training, some of them on the college track. Um, and we sort of help them take care of everything they need, you know, in a wide array of life difficulties they might have. Um, and I know recently a few of the students I've worked with personally went up two or three grade levels in their, past, in their most recent reading scores, so I'm definitely very happy to be working with them. Um, and we have a short video with some more information, so thank you for allowing me to be here today. Hi, uh, my name is Araceli Rojas. I am the post-secondary transition director for the Los Angeles Education Corps. And um, first and foremost, I wanted to thank every single one of you for your donation. Um, 
part of the do donation will be given to all of our post-secondary students who will be transitioning um, from high school to college. And they will be utilizing these donations, whether it's for their dorm supplies, um, for their um, school stuff, anything that it's needed um, within the transition. I know that the majority of our students um, parents um, struggled in this area, especially because we do service students in the low socioeconomic uh, range, and many of them do have the need, um, and you know they do struggle getting these the, this type of support. And um, I wanted just to take an opportunity to thank every single one of you. Um, one of the benefits I feel that being a student part of the education core is that the staff here definitely go above and beyond. I never in a thousand years <laughs> thought that I would have graduated from college. I am the second oldest out of eight children. I did become the first one in my family to transition to a four-year and every other sibling after me has definitely transitioned into a four-year as well. Um, and I think that it, part of the mission within LAEC is definitely um, changing people's lives and generations to come and that's definitely where it started. I mean, I went through a lot of different schools prior to coming here and never once did I see myself going into college and the support, um, the guidance, the mentorship that I receive and continue to receive um, definitely is a one of a kind. Um, and when I mean they guided me through everything from the beginning to the end and it doesn't stop once I graduated high school, it definitely continued um, after I graduated college. So the ongoing support is always there. It's not like we're no longer a student. We're on our own. We're, there, there's still definitely that support and what a better way than um, to now serve back and give back to, to my students because I always reflect back of how it was when I was a student and let's continue improving. Let's continue um, getting better and you know all the students by far have never said like, oh, it's a terrible program or anything like that. All of our students come back, um, younger siblings come back. And I feel that that's definitely the purpose that we want to continue to improve, not just within families, but also within generations. Hey everyone, my name is Noel Rauta Trout. I'm the CEO slash van driver for College Bridge Academy and the Education Corps. Um, I've been working here since 1996 and um, I still love coming to work every day. Um, why? Because we have a holistic program here that'll um, provide education for young people, employment, counseling, just try to kind of meet all their needs. Um, these are second chance students that uh, the regular high school wasn't working for, so we try to make something different that does work for them. Uh, one of the things I really enjoy about this organization too is the opportunity to take kids and kind of get them out of the inner city and um, experience nature. In fact, at the end of this month, we're going to be taking 40 students on a river rafting trip up on the Kern River. So it's things like that that uh, the students remember. I know they're not going to remember my lesson plan on split infinitives in English and all those other exciting things that we put together. But they'll, they'll remember those experiences, and those are equally important. So anyways, thank you for being, taking an interest in our organization and our students. Hi, my name is Tisha Middleton and I am the Chief Academic Officer. I handle most of the programming and the day-to-day -day at the school sites. What makes our school sites special? Well, we love our babies and they come from all different places and they come broken, but um, we meet them where they are and when they leave us, they have a lot more confidence in themselves, they're prepared to meet the world, they um, have experienced some things, they do trips with us, um, they don't have to pay, like everything is taken care of by the school, and yeah, we love them. Would the volunteers please bring the plates forward? Thank you for giving generously.
Thank you. As Matt said, it's just been so difficult to confront the hatred that has been inflicted on our siblings in faith at All Saints and at the Buddhist temple. So we hold them in our hearts and our love and care will help see them through this difficult time. Let us join in prayer. Because we want this country to be different, we will keep turning the earth, holding spade and plow for each other when we need to rest. Because we want something new to live, we will keep creating gardens, art, poetry, children. Because we want their voices to be remembered, we will keep telling their stories, even after they were disbelieved, mocked, or cut out of the book. Because we believe that goodness prevails, we will rest our ear on the ground and listen to creation's holy buzz and sigh with the completeness of it. Because we believe in the clarity of our purpose, the drivenness of our hope, and the beauty between us, we will continue. Amen.
Thank you again. I hope you'll stay after the service. I'm sure folks will want to chat with you about your beautiful music. Thank you. So congratulations, neighborhood. You have just called a wonderful new minister. I have no doubt that Reverend Omega will help lead you into a vital and a meaningful future. There's no more gratifying feeling for an interim minister than knowing that the congregation you have grown to love is in very good hands. I watched her final service and the meeting after, and what really struck me was how much you were cheering her on, how much you clearly want her to be successful, and hopefully wanting to pitch in as well to help make everyone succeed in this wonderful religious community. And I also know it will not be seamless or perfect when she begins, or really ever. She and you will hit potholes on the path to come. To borrow the metaphor that she used in her last service, you will realize you've packed the wrong things for the journey. <laughs> or too much that is irrelevant and weighing you down. This is inevitable and normal and even in a way reassuring because if you feel things are going perfectly, you're not really learning and growing in the way that will be important for you to do. I spent the last week at our traditional transitional ministers meeting in which we talked about how to process the changes that congregations have gone through in the last few years. And I heard more than a few stories about congregations in various levels of turmoil that my colleagues were struggling to address. It seems that we are not moving into a place of steady ease after the pandemic. What a surprise. We recognize that we're living in a constant state of what has come to be called precarity. A more permanent state than just realizing that some things are precarious. The Reverend Cam Cameron Trimble is a UCC pastor and innovator who recently wrote this. She talks about taking flying instructions. We're going to hit some turbulence ahead, my flying instructor said, and you will learn something about your airplane. If you tighten your grip on the yoke, you reduce the aerodynamics of your aircraft. You, as the pilot, actually make the flight less safe, steady, stable. So remember, when the going gets rough, fly loose. She continues, our world today is nothing if not swirling, turbulent, wind tossing us around. We are living through the breakdown and breaking open of much that has defined modern life. In the face of such extraordinary transition, it's natural to look for solutions to our problems. We tightly grip the yoke of our families, businesses, government communities, trying to regain control of people and systems that feel broken or dangerous. And of course, no amount of control will create the conditions needed to traverse these rough winds of change. Particularly when we face threats like those leveled at our local community religious institutions, just because they try to be a safe and welcoming place for people of differing gender identities and sexual orientations, in the face of this, it's tempting to either shut down or search for a clear and perfect solution, neither of which really works. One of my spiritual gurus, Richard Rohr, said, in moments of insecurity and crisis, shoulds and oughts don't really help. They just increase the shame or guilt or pressure and likelihood of backsliding into unhealthy patterns. It is the deep yeses that carry us through to the other side. It's those deeper values we strongly support, such as equality and dignity for all, that allow us to
to wait it out. Or it's someone in whom we absolutely believe and to whom we commit. In plain language, love wins out over guilt any day. This is really a spiritual issue, not just psychological or sociological, because it takes tending to our spirits, developing new ways of being in the world that help us to stay open rather than to shut down or try to control. I'm throwing you lots of quotes in this sermon today because I've been reading some really helpful things that, that can say what I intend to better than I ever could. In this regard, Krista Tippett, the host of the NPR show On Being, said, spiritual life is a way of dwelling with perplexity, taking it seriously, searching for its purpose as well as its perils, its beauty as well as its ravages. In this sense, spiritual life is a reasonable reality-based pursuit it can have mystical points of entry and destinations, to be sure, but it is in the end about befriending reality, the common human experience of mystery included. I've been going through my own much more minor struggle with this desire for certitude. This week marked the beginning of the two and a half week long search process that we interim ministers have to go through to find our next position. I had three interviews in a row last week, one more to come this week, and it is exhausting. A part of me simply wants to turn it all over to somebody else. Let someone else make this difficult choice for me, please. That will just free me up to surf Zillow to look for my next place to live. <laughs> and yet when I can try to calm my anxiety and my need to know right now, I can see that it is necessary to go through these processes of discernment so that I can discern the best place for me to offer my skills and also the best place where I can live the life that I would like. Again, another quote, this from Maria Popova. Nothing, not one thing, hurts us more or causes us to hurt others more than our certainties. The stories we tell, about, tell ourselves about the world and the foregone conclusions with which we cork the fount of possibility are the supreme downfall of our consciousness. They're also the inevitable cost of survival, of navigating a vast and complex reality, most of which remains forever beyond our control and comprehension. And yet in our effort to parse the world, we sever ourselves from the full range of its beauty, tensing against the tenderness of life. Holding ourselves open even when anxiety wants to drive every part of our existence, allows us to see possibilities we might never have seen before. For our seminar, I drove up to join several colleagues in Santa Rosa in what we're now calling a pod. We gather and watch online together around our various computers around the table and then talk and process what we've been seeing and learning. And as I left for my trip, all of my anxiety and frustration about not knowing was balled up inside my body. I almost ached for the desire to know what comes next. But as I drove up the beautiful California coastline, I could feel myself unspooling. Walking along ocean paths, taking picture to try to capture the beauty that surrounded me, I started to feel like I could breathe again. There was nothing in this environment that offered me any solutions for what was coming next. Instead, I could lose myself in something much more boundless than my need to know. And as I spent time with colleagues and very dear friends who've known me for a long time, I could start 
exploring options that I hadn't before considered because I felt wrapped in their love. I am hyper-conscious that the distress I was feeling was in a position of privilege. Many people don't feel that they have choices in what they do for a living, and many people face far more existential distress than what I've been going through. David Zahl is an Episcopal priest who's worked a great deal with vulnerable youth, and he particularly explores the challenge that so many youth face today of feeling the despair of not living up to some kind of social mediaized version of what they should be. So he says this, what would a healthy culture and caring parents do for these kids? They would be pulled aside and told, you are you. You will always be you. We live here on this planet, in this culture, it's as this species. You live in times that you live in, and you will never live anywhere else. There is no escape for any of us. The world gets better, and it gets worse. Your life gets easier, and it gets harder. Progress happens. Happiness is possible, but the world is an irredeemably broken place. Tragedy is the endowment of our bodies and our gods and the world, and you will always, still, always be you. You'll still be you when you head off to school and make brand new friends. You'll still be you after you come out to your parents. You'll still be you after you get that job or that promotion or that raise and you'll still be you after you lose all of those things. You'll still be you after you fall in love, and you'll still be you after the AI revolution, or the socialist revolution, or the love revolution, or any other revolution. <laughs> the only sensible path forward is to learn to accept the brokenness of human life, to develop resilience in the face of its petty cruelties, and to learn to live with yourself. Advice that is helpful, I think, for any of us, not just youth. For the last few years, I've been collecting advice from a variety of sources about what helps us be more resilient in the face of ongoing and seemingly permanent distress. So I'll summarize just a few things I've heard, particularly from Lucy Hone, an expert on resilience. First of all, we have to accept that suffering is a part of human existence. It always has been, always will be. In the past, we probably found various ways to avoid that reality, but it always catches up with us. The question of why me is a pretty useless one. What do I need to face is far more important. Another point is that greater resilience can be found when we force ourselves to, attend, to focus on what we can change, what opportunities may lie before us, the things we have no control over, perhaps, but there are some things we can do. These include trying to attend to the positive rather than the ever-present negative. Our brains are actually hardwired to pay closer attention to danger and negative things, but we can overcome that predilection and consciously choose to see the beauty and the life-giving things that surround us all the time. And third, we can be more conscious of the effects of our decisions. We can ask ourselves, am I choosing something that is life-giving? and healthy for me? Or am I losing myself in the self-destructive behaviors that are all too tempting when we feel ourselves out of control? These are important things to remember as individuals, but also as a religious community. To accept that there will always and inevitably be disappointments along the way, to attend to that which we can participate in changing not expecting others to do it for us. 
to consciously attend to that which is good and beautiful and to make conscious decisions toward health. The very thing we're doing with our resource fair today. Thank you, pastoral care team. Precarity will always be our state of being. We know this now more than ever. The question is, how do we face it, both as individuals and as a community? The poet Pablo Neruda reminds us, there is no insurmountable solitude. All paths lead to the same goal, to convey to others what we are, and we must pass through solitude and difficulty, isolation and silence in order to reach forth to that enchanted place where we can dance our clumsy dance and sing our sorrowful song. But in this dance or in this song, there are fulfilled the most ancient rights of our conscience in the awareness of being human and believing in a common destiny. Clumsy and sorrowful we may be at times, but together we can dance and sing and remember and connect and find joy in unexpected places. May this give us an abiding comfort and peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 182 in the gray hymnal or on the screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing number 182, Oh, the Beauty in a Life. Our benediction is one of my favorite that I've shared with you many times from the Native American poet, Rosemary Watola Tromer. Over and over, we break open. We break and we break and we open. For a while, we try to fix the vessel as if to be broken is bad, as if with glue and tape and a steady hand, we might bring things to perfect again, as if they were ever perfect, as if they were, as if to be broken is not also perfect, as if to be open is not the path toward joy. Amen. Go in peace. So as we are tuning, uh, I want to reiterate, the, this is 
CalArts Japan Ensemble. Uh, one thing that CalArts is facing, and you know, every university is facing, is that after the pandemic, people are deciding what classes need to stay and what classes need to be cut. So, uh, more so than any sort of financial support, if you could shoot an email to the dean of CalArts, uh, <laughs> you know that you know that you really enjoy the concert and. It's really cool, you know. And if you went to CalArts, you would take this class, right? So, <laughs> uh, so yeah. I mean, any and the music dean or the the actual dean or the president, you know. And I definitely see alum in the in the audience. I think you would have a lot of say in this. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, we're gonna play Tonari no Totoro. It's come. It's from the movie My Neighbor Totoro. If you know that. So uh, thank you all.